what I wanted to do, we're, we're going to go back to the project work, as you know. So I'll, I'll ask you to, to go back to what you did yesterday, the problem identification, and now look at actually what your action plans are going to be and, and to prepare your presentations. But before doing that, I thought it would be useful to try to recap a little bit what we've tried to do over the course of these two days. So we've tried to address the question of why PFM reforms have not delivered. There's been an unprecedented level of spending on PFM reforms, both by the development community, but also by governments themselves. And uh, although there has been improvement in PFM systems internationally, I mean, people who say it hasn't improved are wrong. There has been improvement, and we saw that on the PEFA scores, and there are other evaluations that also show that. And in particular, a lot of the changes are located in the area of quick wins. You know, these are the, the, the PEFA scores that relate to aspects of comprehensiveness and transparency, which for the most part require improvements in, in the presentation of information and increased timeliness and accessibility of information. The more fundamental changes related to control systems, to accounting systems, and to audit systems are very clearly below uh, what would normally be considered uh, an essential level of functionality. There are a number of theories. The first is simply that more time is needed, that reforms are complex, and one cannot expect significant changes in, in functionality within a short space of time. I think we all had a degree of sympathy with that without really being convinced. The second argument, which we saw Matt Andrews present uh, for himself in the video yesterday, is that PFM reforms, in particular in developing countries, have been externally imposed based on predefined blueprints, in other words, often based on a, an idea of what the solution is, before assessing the problem properly and designing context-specific solutions. And I think after two days, I would reconfirm what our own thoughts were then, that yes, time is needed. In some cases, that argument is valid. Certainly, the context <coughs> and the specificity of reforms is important, but perhaps this argument is overplayed. Uh, if we look at our own countries, uh, the OECD countries have all copied from each other. So copying is normal, and in the PFM world, a lot of what we've learned about the best systems of accounting, the best systems of revenue administration, the best systems of treasury management, are now standard across the world, and, and for good reasons. The political commitment one is fundamental. And the qualitative research on the impact of public finance management reforms, the qualitative research which I've been involved with in, in Malawi, Burkina Faso, and Ghana, but also the qualitative research that the World <coughs> Bank have done looking at fragile states, looking at Afghanistan, Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, Palestine, confirm that the countries that make the most progress are countries where there is a genuine political commitment. And in the particular case of Burkina Faso, for example, in the 12-year period when they made their reforms, what happened was that any director who was not making progress on reforms would be shifted, or occasionally even sacked. And people were very deliberately chosen because of their commitment to reform and their ability to make reform happen in their particular departments. Something that we didn't see in Ghana. When the integrated financial management system stalled, the accountant general didn't get changed. Uh, even the project manager, as I recall, did not get changed. Because there was not a proper process of oversight, fundamentally, because the politicians didn't care enough. So that argument, we think, is very powerful. And we've had a look through our own experience in Nicaragua and by sharing some experiences of your own in your own countries and what it means to work with politicians. And part of the problem isn't necessarily that politicians don't care. It's partly that they don't appreciate the relevance of some of these reforms to the types of agendas that politicians do care about. And in, in Nicaragua, in a sense, we were lucky. To, to have been able to participate in, in discussions with senior political leaders and to get the medium-term expenditure process understood by the political leaders who could in turn make it be implemented and make real use of it. So when we say politicians are not committed, that doesn't mean that we stand back and just sort of say, well, okay, that's karma, let's wait until something changes. What we're trying to say, and one of the messages we want to share with you, is that 
it's our own responsibility as technicians and reformers, advisors, <coughs> to find ways of communicating with politicians and find ways of making sure that there is commitment and growing commitment over time. We also spoke about the issue of how much focus there is on service delivery in the first place. Um, I mean, I don't think we have a very representative sample of people here because I think the South African government, um, certainly uh, since it became a, a democratic country, has had a focus on service delivery from the very centre. But in other countries, in, in Mozambique, uh, uh, in many other countries in which uh, we work, it's clear that the Ministry of Finance worries about fiscal discipline, worries about budget allocations, but sees service delivery as somebody else's problem. And the countries that have changed that, have, that have deliberately brought service delivery into the mandate of the Ministry of Finance, the UK, Sweden, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, uh, Chile, have succeeded in making changes and getting improvements in service delivery, which are well documented. So there are dangers in this process, but there is a very real role for a Ministry of Finance not only to engage politicians with the right language, but also to engage with service delivery agents within structured ways. And then finally, picking up again on one of the big themes that Mahandrews emphasizes, we need more systematic learning in the process of managing PFM reforms and in the process of government. And we looked yesterday at some examples of how that might be done. We had a look at the early warning system in Nicaragua, uh, and we, we, we noticed that simply by bringing together existing databases in a dynamic and interesting way, we were getting information on the tables of decision makers and helping to create uh, more, more feedback about the way service delivery was going and about the way government was being run. We had a look at Chile, where Chile very early in its reform program introduced program evaluations that allowed 10% of their programs to be terminated as a result of, of evaluations. Another 25%, as I recall, to be fundamentally changed. So they used evaluations to change things. And they weren't frightened of using the evaluations to do that. So there are examples. We're not trying to say that these things can be replicated. In a sense, one of our theses is that it's very difficult. One should be cautious about any type of replication. But we just like to encourage you all to learn from these experiences, to share them, and to recognise that there's much more you can do uh, within your own jobs to, to make PFM deliver in terms of improved services. And that more focus on service delivery, more focus on how we interact with politicians, more focus on learning, and more focus on context will make real difference to the way PFM reforms work.